privilege for me to be here. Last time I was in uh, one of those rooms was taking my MPhil examination. <laughs> 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 it's a little bit intimidating. <laughs> I think I'll get over it. Thank you all for coming. Historically, Muslim approaches to the Bible have been much more diverse than is usually assumed today. Whereas the Muslim accusation of tahrif, textual corruption of the Bible by Jews and Christians, as we've uh, come to learn already today, has all but driven Muslim-Christian dialogue to a deadlock today, the history of development of that concept indicates that this has not always been the case. The Muslim approach to the Bible has had two principal thrusts, one of them positive and the other negative. A return to the history of the Islamic approach to the Bible would indicate that the original intention of Muslims was mostly positive, <coughs> namely an attempt at rescuing the text of the Bible from the perceived Jewish and Christian misinterpretations of it. The more negative attitudes issuing from the Muslim accusation that Jews and Christians had corrupted the very text of their scriptures, Tahrif al lafal only came later in the intellectual history of the Tahrif concept. And I have demonstrated this in greater details in, uh, in an article on the history of Tahrif. The present paper will focus its attention on the positive Islamic approaches to the Bible and we heard about the tahrif earlier today. My research into the Islamic exegetical discourse on God and Christ has convinced me of the centrality of the biblical text in the Muslim Christian encounter. The Christian doctrines are so fundamentally connected with the Holy Scriptures that it is impossible to discuss the Islamic challenge to Christian theology without approaching it exegetically. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all claim to be revealed religions. In other words, they claim to have come into the world as a, manif as a manifestation of God's decision and initiative to reveal himself, rather than having emerged through a human effort to reach out and understand the divine. In addition, however, Christianity may be referred to as a religion of personal encounter. Whereas in Islam, God revealed his will to the world in a book through the intermediary of a prophet, the fundamental premise of the Christian faith is that God revealed himself in the person of Christ. Judaism is somewhat closer to Islam in that it understands that God revealed his will in the Torah through Moses. But short of stopping there, God continued to reveal his will and to address, address his people through a line of <coughs> prophetic recipients. Christians believe that this encounter experience is reflected upon and narrated in the scriptures and that theological doctrines are then derived from this record. As such, Christians through the ages have not attempted to come up with theological doctrines primarily in line with plain logic. Rather, while using the, philo the philosophical language of their time and striving towards a reasonable theological discourse, they usually attempted to construct their theology and derive it from the received scriptures that reflect the divine encounter with them. The fundamental importance of the biblical text in the development of Christian doctrine, and on the other hand, the de demonstrable centrality of the Bible in the Muslim discourse with Christians, both call for a careful examination of the underlying attitude of Muslim theologians towards the Bible. I'm also very glad that we were able to hear this morning about a Muslim who has written a commentary on the Bible, which really reaffirms the centrality of the biblical text in the Muslim mindset of the period. The history of the biblical text among Muslim theologians and writers is all but forgotten today, both when Christians develop their theological discourse in Muslim context, as well as when Muslims approach the biblical text today. The fact that the Bible has been used so extensively by Muslim theologians through history makes it absurd, if not impossible, 
for Christians to do theology in a Muslim context without giving primary attention to the important hermeneutical factor, to that uh, factor. Conversely, this history of perception and of interpretation cannot simply be ignored by Muslim theologians today when they approach the biblical text. But not only is this history ignored, the negative seasons, seasons of that history are most prominent in the minds and hearts of Muslims and Christians, affecting present-day relations so negatively that they constantly push the two communities towards conflict. Of course, at the professional and academic levels of interaction, we have generally learned to be cordial and gracious towards each other. For example, it would not be politically correct for me to stand here today before you at the University of Oxford and offer a paper under the title Refutation, Destruction and Indictment of the Most Fo Foolish and Abominable Book Forged from <laughs> Beginning to End by the Arab Mahomet that is to say, of the so-called fate of the Agarines. Now, that was a real title by Nicetas of Byzantium in the 9th century in response to a Muslim letter. Nor would it be proper for a Muslim colleague to hold a discourse about Christianity and the Bible in the spirit of Ibn Hazm's 11th century Kitab al-Fisal fil-Milal wal-Ahwa wal-Nihal and say, refer to the Apostle Peter, Peter as a urinating goat, a place in Bawal. You mentioned some of the, uh, that's just one example of the sort of, uh, of uh, words that Ibn Hazm uses towards the evangelists and other biblical characters. At least in formal settings, times have changed. We can be grateful for that. However, the same, the same may unfortunately <coughs> not be said about the more popular level discourse between Christians and Muslims. Enter a Muslim bookstore in, an, in any Arab country and you'll find title after title of rehashed material from Ibn Hazm, Shihab al-Din al-Qarafi, or Ibn Qayyim al jawziya Tune into one of the many Arab Christian satellite channels such as Al-Hayat TV, or on one of the multiple websites available and you will be projected back to the medieval Christian discourse of many a polemical text against Islam, Muhammad, and the Quran. Despite the civilizing pressures that our formal discourse has undergone, therefore, the popular discourse of Christians and Muslims, often instigated by our popular preachers and teachers, leaves much to be desired. <coughs> The Islamic view of the Bible has historically been more complex than it is sometimes made to appear. Contrary to what may be assumed as a result of today's situation, Muslim authors did not always jump at the first opportunity to accuse Christians and Jews of corrupting the text of their scriptures, i.e. to the accusation of textual tahrif. In fact, historically, the opinion of Muslim theologians with regard to biblical authority has ranged from deep respect to outright disdain, with a strong bias in favor of the former before the 11th century and of the latter beyond that. I've classified the Muslim positions by organizing them under four themes, which represent most of the attitudes I have found in the text that I have studied. The first two themes, the Injil used as an authoritative document, historical or other, and the Injil as an, as, a, as an authoritative key for the evaluation of hadith represents the apex of Muslim theologians' respect for the biblical text. Not only did most authors cite extensively from the Bible in order to demonstrate their anti-Christian arguments, which is in itself revealing of a positive attitude towards the, te the text, but such authors as Ibn Qutayba and Al-Yaqubi went as far as using the biblical text in works of history, tarikh, literature, and the jurisprudence, fiqh, hadith, which were primarily written for a Muslim readership. And that is uh, very interesting. The third theme, on the other hand, is more neutral in nature, though it can be interpreted both positively and negatively. The fact that such authors as Al-Qasim al-Rassi or Al-Yaqubi, for example, incorporated whole chapters from the Gospels into their treatises while altering specific key terms 
may indicate that they cherished the text too much to do away with it completely and prefer to preserve it by presenting a more acceptable version of it. On the other hand, this process can also be seen as already reflecting a suspicious attitude towards the text that they were reproducing. Finally, the argument of tahrif as the fourth theme represents an outright accusation against Christians and Jews of having corrupted their own scriptures or tampered, to use the word uh, used earlier today. But as already noted, even this accusation is not as simple and straightforward or as simple and straightforward as, as, forward as it is sometimes imagined. I've already demonstrated that there was a clear historical development in the understanding and use of the original Quranic term. And the uncompromising attitude of Ibn Hazm in the 11th century was not to be found elsewhere, either before or after him. With this, we come to a more details, a detailed study of the first three themes. And uh, for <coughs> limited, due to limited time, I'll take one principal example, one main example for each of the themes, although there are multiple examples. The two main representatives of this first attitude, the Bible and history, or the Injil as a reliable historical document, uh, are Abu Muhammad Abdullah bin Muslim ibn Qutayba, respected Sunni Qadi of Dinawa, whose most important works date mainly from the latter half of the 9th century, and his contemporary Shia historian at the Tahirid court in Khurasan, Ahmad bin Abi Yaqub, known as Al Yaqubi. These two 9th century Muslim writers were happy to glean authoritative knowledge outside the boundaries of Muslim texts and traditions. Their attitude is nicely illustrated in the following statement of Ibn Qutayba in his Kitab Uyun al-Akhbar, a large compendium of traditions and stories written in the 850s, in which he deals with all sorts of subjects organized into 10 large sections, or books, kutub. This is what he says. Knowledge is a quarry for the believer, and it will benefit him whensoever he takes it. And it will not detract from the truth to hear it from an unbeliever, nor is pure gold harmed by the fact of its extraction from the soil. He who fails to take a beautiful thing from its place lets an opportunity slip, and opportunities pass by like the clouds. <clears throat> Both writers were scholars of history, among other sciences and literary genres, and like most classical histories or historians, their interest was chiefly in sacred history. Muslim historians would often begin their account from Adam and come all the way to their own time, using primarily Muslim traditions as their source materials. In his Kitab al-Ma'arif, an encyclopedic work with entries on topics from all branches of knowledge, Ibn Qutayba quotes several times from the Gospels after he has cited other traditions from the Qusas, <coughs> the storytellers of the Islamic tradition. The famous narrator of traditions, Wahab ibn al-Munabbih, is generally his principal source of information on sacred history. But when he is transmitting information from, it, from the historical period of Jesus, he quotes from the Gospels. This is quite unlike the approach of Zaydi theologian Al-Qasim al-Rassi, a convert from Christianity, Ali al-Tabari, in both their treatises entitled Kitab al-Rad al-Nasar. So both al-Rassi and uh, Ali al-Tabari uh, have a very different approach uh, from that of uh, Ibn Qutayba. They used the same passages as uh, quite often as Ibn Qutayba did, for instance, they used the genealogies of Jesus in order to demonstrate his human descent and to counter, counter the Christian view of Christology. Ibn Qutayba, on the other hand, has no polemical agenda. He examines the genealogy of Matthew's Gospel as he attempts to establish the chronology of the world and to set the life of, of the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, in that larger context. After noting some discrepancies between the year counts of Wahab, Akrama, the Gospel of Matthew, and others, he simply concludes, Wallahu a'lam, God knows better. 
which is a classic closing statement of a Muslim scholar when he is before irreconcilable traditions, especially in Hadith scholarship. If Ibn Qudaybah had no polemical purpose when he used the Gospel text, uh, our second historian, Shi'i al-Ya'qubi, had even less of an axe to grind. He quotes extensively from the Gospels as a reliable historical authority in his tarikh. His work is in two parts. The first begins with the history of the patriarchs of Israel down to the time of Muhammad. And the second part is the double size of the first, beginning with Muhammad and the, and the early history of Islam until his own day in 872. The first part contains quite a long section on the life of Jesus and the apostles. His account of the life of Jesus is based on quotations drawn from, from all four Gospels. And in each case, he spells out the verse reference from which he is citing, not from uh, our contemporary uh, verse divisions, but from the uh, more classical one. This in itself is quite significant, since so many of the other Muslim writers mainly drew from Matthew's Gospel. He also reports briefly on the early church on the basis of passages from the Book of Acts. On the whole, the New Testament documents are used as objective sources. For instance, when he gives the account about the birth of Mary and then her pregnancy with Jesus and her giving birth, he mentions, in agreement with the Quran, that Jesus spoke in the cradle. But a little further he adds, but as for the people of the, of the Gospel, they do not say that he spoke in the cradle. And they say that Mary was betrothed, betrothed to a man called Joseph, a son of David, and that she became pregnant. And that's it. His exposition of both versions could not be any more objective. Not only does he give freely the Gospel account, but he does not even make any attempt at evaluation or harmonization in light of his preceding exposition of the Muslim account. The second um, argument, or the second uh, general area or approach to the use of the Gospels among Muslims, is uh, the use of the Injil as an authoritative document useful for Hadith interpretation. And even taking it further, using the Gospel as corrective of Islamic traditions. Hadith interpretation was one of the most important disciplines in Islam, and for some schools, only material originating from within Islam would have been considered a legitimate, legitimate source, both for the interpretation and for the authentication of such material. That such an important religious figure as Ibn Qutaybah should make extensive use of the Bible as an, as, as an additional tool for the authentication of Muslim traditions is quite significant. The work on which the present section is based is Ibn Qutaybah's Kitab Ta'wil Mukhtalif al-Hadith, the interpretation of divergences in the Hadith. In it, Ibn Qutaybah deals with a large number of traditions of the Hadith whose authenticity had been questioned by various Muslim scholars. After discussing diverse opinions on a particular tradition and compiling evidence from multiple sources, Ibn Qutaybah will state his own preference and conclude whether he considers a certain hadith authentic or spurious. On several occasions, he cites a passage from the Gospels after citing other Islamic traditions. And every time he does that, it is in order to support his own conclusion. Due to shortness of time, I'll only mention one example today. A hadith discussed by Ibn Qutaybah is one that mentions Waj, a geographical location in the Arabian Peninsula, as being God's last footstool on earth. So this hadith refers to Waj as God's last footstool on earth. This sort of anthropomorphic language about God made Muslim writers of the time quite uncomfortable. Different interpretations of this saying tried to eliminate the anthropomorphism, and uh, particularly uh, Ibn Qutaybah argues against the position of the Mu'tazila that uh, wants to uh, uh, take anthropomorphic language as uh, analogical or 
symbolic. Ibn Qutaybah is especially in favor of the one that interprets the footstool as representing God's treading of a nation. And he says that uh, it's far from dislike and close to the heart. Hence, the saying would be telling about the Prophet's final victory over polytheists in Waj. But after asserting his, his appreciation that this interpretation is far from dislike and close to the heart, Ibn Qutaybah stops short of endorsing it, and he affirms that this could not have been the original intention of Muhammad. His reason for doing so? Because I have read in the true gospel that Christ, peace be upon him, said to the disciples, Did you not hear that it was said to the ancients, Do not lie if you have sworn by God, may he be exalted, but say the truth? And I say to you, do not swear by anything, neither by the heaven, for it is God's throne, may he be exalted, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, Baitul Maqdis, for it is the city of the great king, and Malikul Akbar. And do not swear by your own head, for you are unable to add a single black or white hair to it. But let your word be yes for yes, and no for no. And whatever else besides this is from the devil. Ibn Qutayba prefers to avoid resolving the tension created by anthropomorphism and simply endorses the legitimacy of using such language based on the testimony of the Gospel, Matthew 5, 33 37. It is clear that our jurist takes the words of Jesus at face value and is fully authoritative, even against other Islamic interpretations of this tradition. Note also Ibn Qutayba's appeal to what he calls the authentic gospel, al Injil al-Sahih, which in his case is no other than the text that was used by his Christian contemporaries. In contrast, Al-Qasim al-Rasi, who again preserves the same gospel passage, omits any mention of the earth being God's footstool. Instead, he recasts verse 35 in totally new language as follows. Neither by the earth, for it is the dwelling of God's mercy and signs. <laughs> Interesting rendering. In the same way, Yahubi also omits any anthropomorphism by transforming verses 34 to 35 as follows. And do not swear by God, either saying the truth or lying, nor by his heaven or by his earth. The third argument, or the third uh, theme, is what I call the Islamization of the Gospel text. It's a reinterpretation through translation. In the final section of the, the present paper, um, this, this uh, section is also one of the most interesting ones in our assessment of the attitude of Muslim theologians toward the Christian scriptures. On the one hand, it represents a less optimistic approach than the two attitudes examined previously, in that it does not unconditionally receive the text as Christians have preserved it. On the other, it may be seen as an attempt by Muslim writers to rescue the Bible from what they viewed as an abuse of the text by Christian theologians. That process would reflect an inherent attachment of those authors to the Bible, while the Muslim theologians examined in the first two sections made virtually unconditional and unqualified use of the Gospels, under this third heading, a more critical outlook is displayed. The archetypical example of this process of Islamization of the Gospel text is the treatise of one of our earliest theologians, the Zaydi Shia Imam al Qasim al Rasi in Yemen. Overall, in his Rad al Masara, the first eight chapters of Matthew's Gospels are retranslated almost in full, but with additions, subtractions, and alterations that made them more compatible with the Islamic worldview. In fact, all of his citations are in Saja form, and I personally, which is the Quranic rhymed prose, I personally believe that it was his own rendering, his own uh, version. In a sense, one can say that the philosophy behind his attitude towards the Christian scriptures is not very different from the early Christian attitude towards the Hebrew scriptures. 
They viewed Islam as an extension and culmination of God's revelation to humanity, and he sought the appropriation of former revealed scriptures for the new religion. His approach, however, differed from that of the early Orthodox Christian fathers, in that alterations are brought into the received text, and doubts are expressed as to the reliability and honesty of the transmitters. A striking parallel attitude among early Christians can be found in someone like Marcion, who charged the Gospels were full of Judaizing influences and felt it was his duty to purge these received texts from any passages reflecting unfaithful transmission. Again, for lack of time, I'll only mention one interesting Gospel passage among a myriad of examples that uh, are found in Arasi. I'll point out textual alterations he made that have polemical and exegetical significance. It's only when we give attention to the detail that we uncover his deeper intentions. Um, a significant set of alterations enters Rassi's narration of John the Baptist's announcement and baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River in Matthew 3, 11-15. His text displays six departures from the canonical version, which all are part of his effort at Islamizing the text of the Gospel. In verse 11, instead of the canonical reading, one who is more powerful than I is coming after me, Arasi's text reads, the one who is coming after me is more favored by God than I am. The emphasis is shifted from a power inherent to Jesus to a divine favor bestowed on him. Secondly, at the end of the same verse, Rassi avoids altogether mentioning the Baptist assertion that Christ would baptize people with the Holy Spirit and fire. He may have wanted to avoid the difficult implication that this would have on the usual Islamic designation of the angel Gabriel by the name of the Quds and possibly also the undesirable association with the paraclete of John's Gospel. Thirdly, in verse 12, instead of his winnowing fork is in his hand, Arasi's text reads, he is the one in whose hand God will place the winnowing fork. Again, Christ's full reliance on God for his ministry is emphasized. Fourthly, in verse 13, instead of preserving the canonical reading that Christ came to John to be baptized by him, Rassi's text reads, so that he would baptize him with water and purify him. The addition of purify, yutahiru, consigns Christ to a purely human status, since he needed purification from sins, in the same way as the rest of the crowds that came to John. And fifthly, in verse 15, instead of Christ's baptism taking place in order to fulfill all righteousness, Rassi's version reads, thus we ought to, uh, to be fulfilled, or we ought to be perfected, nastatim in Arabic, through the practice of all righteousness. And six, at the end of verse 15, Rassi adds, or whatever of it, that is, whatever of righteousness, is accessible to us. Again, quite a strong um, alteration. All of the above alterations are clearly introduced in order to reduce Christ to a more purely human status. The popular discourse that has developed between Christians and Muslims since the venerable time of the few citations we've just surveyed has much deteriorated. This is not really surprising. The popular discourse is rarely analytical. Instead, it mostly follows developmental trends. I've demonstrated elsewhere that the writings of Ibn Hazm in the 11th century marked a significant turning point in the literary discourse. Everything points to the fact that by the 13th century, Muslim writers were not citing the biblical text directly any longer, but were dogmatically drawing from collections that had been put together within Muslim circles for the specific use of Muslim polemicists, which is why I was very pleasantly surprised by uh, 
latest uh, presentation, which shows actually an actual encounter with the text in the 14th century. I've not, not seen anything like it. Ibn Hazm's writings also coincided with dramatic historical events on the world stage. The Reconquista in his own Andalusian world of southern Spain, and the Crusader Wars in the East. These developments deeply affected the popular discourse as well. Ibn Qutayba's respectful attitude to the Bible and his creative and positive use of it have been forgotten under the heap of insults that Ibn Hazm and his heirs have leveled against it. Similarly, Patriarch Timothy I's remarkable creativity and respect toward Islam's prophet Muhammad has faded as a result of the spiteful legacy left by the life of Abdel Masih al Kindi or George Hamad Tolos. Sadly, it is the later negative legacy that has been repeated endlessly over the past millennium and often translated into Western languages. That's the, one we most, we, that's the one we more often than not run into in the streets of Cairo, Marrakesh, and Jeddah, and these days almost as certainly as well in Paris, London, and Geneva. I suspect that most of the Christians in this room who have had a significant religious discussion with a Muslim have been rebuffed one time or other by the accusation of tahrid, corruption of the Bible. And I wonder how many Muslims among us have themselves used the, the accusation and cut short the conversation on Christian doctrine based on the Bible. Sadly, this is the, cent the centerpiece of our legacy when it comes to the Muslim view of the Bible. The goal, I suspect, of a symposium like this one is to bring into light a more wholesome landscape of this intellectual history. It is to re-emphasize the brighter, more creative dimensions of that history that can inspire a more hopeful discor discourse among Christians and Muslims today. But we'd also be fooling ourselves if we thought that this academic, intellectual exercise will have a positive impact on Christian-Muslim relations without us investing a tremendous amount of energy on converting our own preachers and teachers and bringing the more inspiring portions of the discourse into their consciousness and worldview. Is there a way forward? I propose five brief points that uh, we can explore further, uh, and each one would need far more discussion. I, would, I propose exploring the developmental history of the dialogical discourse on the core theological disputes between Muslims and Christians. So studying these, uh, this discourse in its development through history. Secondly, I propose to identify key arguments in this, what I call the meta-dialogue, <coughs> that have brought it to a standstill and explore the reasons and motivations for this standstill. Thirdly, I propose to bring to light the more creative and dynamic moments in that meta-dialogue and explore their legitimacy and authority. Fourthly, I think we need to educate Christian and Muslim teachers and preachers about the more fruitful moments of our dialogical history. And fifth and finally, we need to help our teachers and preachers to understand the hermeneutical method of the other so that they might recover a legitimate, even if disagreeing, discourse about the other. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. It's a good slide to leave up there as a basis for our... Uh conversations. Who would like to start us 